I want to be the inspiration that sparks the person to live out what I thought I could accomplish. My my goal was to be the fastest man ever and make people not want to run track. You're so you're talking about somebody <laughs> that had in their mind to run 42.5, you know, at 21 years old. My ultimate healing for track and my disappointment in myself is going to come through the movie. I'm Joshua Potts, Mr. Possible, always with the brother with the same mother, Aaron Potts, Super Hot Potts, and your favorite two black runners coming at you every single two black two. Let's go, man. It's been a while since we've been live Hello. on a podcast with y'all. And Joshua, I'm super excited. Like, we got a whole legend on the, they don't on the know. podcast today. They, they really don't know. They don't know. They don't know. Like, this this reminds <laughs> me of, like, it's crazy because the person we have on today, these are, like, stories that were, like, passed down to me, like, over and over and over again. So... For now, we in this age where everybody know everybody. Every, well, everyone already already knew everyone, but everybody on podcasts and social media, so you can actually meet these people. So I'm I'm super excited for what we got planned, Joshua. Most definitely, and just for some from some person out there that hasn't been like deep in the game and or just like living in Southern California in this club world, be able to be introduced to this story and hopefully this inspires somebody else's. But I, let's just get into it, man, because who we got on today, we got the former World Youth 400 meter record holder. The dude ran a 45 one in 1995 you're as a you ran that same year you ran a 149 one as well and he ran a 20.7 in a 10 5 in the 100 literally can do it all he's in the pasadena sports hall of fame pin relays wall of fame 1996 track and field news high school athlete of the year this dude was basically like the second coming for track and field for a good minute and he's still doing great things in the track game we got obi moore man myth the legend on the podcast podcast john muir high school legend and everything above obi we're so happy to have you on the pod man so happy. Hey, peace to the young gods peace to the young gods i'm glad to be here yeah we appreciate you man and like thinking back like what is it like what is it like for you like being where you where you're at now though it's just like in your competitive career from what you did when you were such like a young man that people that are kind of are close to your age then like still remember you like i i'm 27 i still remember the stories of obi moore and all the things you've done and i'm and I'm, I'm hoping like we get to pass this on to the next generation because i feel like your legend isn't gonna die but how, how do you ever do you think of yourself as a legend or like what is that feeling like um for me because i tell everybody i probably only reach 60 percent of my potential because of my injuries um, so to pass that information on, um, through my book, through my movie that I have coming out through the two documentaries that I did with flow track. I don't know if you guys mm -hmm. seen the one with flow track and then the one I did with PBS, um, born to run. And now I'm about to hit them hard with mega Evers wife. I don't know if you guys know who mega Evers was. He got killed by the KKK or the sheriffs. Um, he was bigger than Martin Luther King, beautiful brother, but his wife is a humanitarian and she has a, a black film company and she mm -hmm. wants to do a film. So we were working for the last three years to get this film out. I want the film to come out around the next Olympics because that's what okay. most people like track. You know, unless you're a real yeah. track head and really in the family of track, <laughs> you're not going to look at track meets every, every weekend. You're going to look at the Olympics. So I wanted to come out around the Olympics and it's, it's real basic. Uh, just like Where's Waldo, Where's Obi. So I've been promoting <laughs> through T-shirts and just the travels and the and the um, uh, experiences that I didn't had being a so-called legend and people not knowing that I didn't reach my full potential. So the whole key is to transfer that information over so somebody that has the genetics, that has the work ethic, 
that has the coaches, the facilities around them mm-hmm. can, can tap into their Usain Boltism, their Obiism. You know, they uh, uh, everybody that's been great. It's you have to have the full package. So it's just not having the talent or the genetics or the work. You have to have everything to line up. So I want to I want to pinpoint that. How do you line up your career and set it up where you've known forever? And it's crazy that I didn't have it lined up and I'm still known forever. I will always be recognized as, you know, a living legend, which is cool. Yeah. And I'll definitely say my first time going to Junior Olympics was in 2010. I was 10 years old, a Bantam boy. And I remember like distinctively, we were sitting, everybody in the tent. It was in Sacramento. And like we we got the program and everything. And I remember my coach like just standing up and saying, oh, you guys going to open up the program. Look at those records. Like y'all going to go for that four by four record uh, this Sunday or whatever. And he's like, hey, look in that record book. Obi got everything in there and we were looking I was like this man dude got every single record in the record book from like the four and the eight so it was amazing to just finally be able like to talk to you and have this conversation it's crazy and I'm so glad like you're doing that movie that sounds awesome because I'm really I love movies just in general and documentaries and I would love to see more stories in track and field and I think your story is definitely worth telling like over you said for the past three years so, so like were there like um uh, a lot of complications with like COVID like popping up. Did that set you guys back a little bit as well? Oh, big time. COVID set us back. And then we've been, cause part of the movie is dealing with an animation character as me as a child. Okay. Looking at me as going through the different stages through the LA Jets, through John Muir, through the Olympics. So that animation character is actually me and then turns into me in real life. So it's just real detailed um, information because I don't know anything about animation. So just reaching out <laughs> to different people and different companies. And um, yeah, so COVID held us back a lot because, um, you know, you can't meet in person. Yeah. Dang, we getting oh. like the real drops right now. The movie, movie coming out. You said a, you said a book is going to, you're working on a book as well? Well, I already wrote the book. The book is called The Secret of Speed and Endurance. And then I got an animation book that I'm doing um, with my cousin, who's an artist. So I just want to get that. So with the um, with the animation book, that's more just tapping into your superhero. You know, knowing that you are on this planet to uh, inspire other people. So the way we the way we have it set up, this is all about inspiring people, which we call in the spirit, making people tap into their spirit. So the animation. It's just, uh, hey, when I slept on that track, I I would have your mother or your father cheering for me because I'm tapped into the spirit. So the highest level of um, sprinting and that I did, I knew I knew that I wasn't running. I was actually tapped into the spirit. So when you tap into the spirit, time 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 doesn't exist. It's a different feeling. And a lot of people don't get to go into those zones. So when you see people like Kobe Bryant, you know, or Michael yeah. Jordan, they in, they in the spirit. It's something else. So when you program the nervous system to do something over and over, that's more robotic. And then once you get from the robotic, oh, you got to be at the 200 at this time. You got to be at the uh-huh. 400, run the 800 at this time. But then when you tap into the spirit, something else takes over. And that's the spirit. I love that. And like... And that's one thing I wanted to talk more about you because, I mean, you were in a lot of those those situations, whether it was pin relays or running somebody do that state where down at state. And like we said, like the reason why your story and legend is there because you touched people and you impacted them by the way you ran and everything. And seeing now I follow you on Instagram and everything and I see you're like into holistic, holistic health and everything. And you do that with your personal training. Was that oh, something, yeah, did, did that come from like what you went through Did you, or were you always tapped into that? Did, were your parents like into that or when did so, you start? My name is a Nigerian name, which mm-hmm. means lots of heart, but it also means king. So I had glimpses of it growing up, but I didn't, I didn't know how to tap into it fully. Mm. Now dealing with my injury that happened my senior year, um, I was able to get involved with yoga, changing my diet. I was trying to figure out how to heal myself rather than go and get an operation and, you know, mend my hamstring back together. 
And then I just started reading books after books. I was reading about 20 books a week just on all type of information, metaphysics, comparative religion, linguistics, um, health, herbs, anything I could do just to stimulate because that was my, my, my goal was to be the fastest man ever and make people not want to run track. You so you're train. talking about somebody that had <laughs> in their mind to run 42.5, you know, at 21 years old. So I think, um, I think uh, the creator or some people could say God, it, it just wasn't meant to be. But I learned so much getting injured. So that took me on a, uh, 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 that took me on a freeway of just learning a lot of stuff. So when I got involved with the holistic sciences, I turned into a business. I've mm -hmm. never worked for nobody in my life. Never will. I can't. <laughs> um, and uh, it's been it's been good for me. And then, you know, just helping people with their health, prostate cancer, um, um, eye problems, fibroid tumors, weight loss. It just goes hand in hand with personal training. And then I'm able to transfer my information over to adults young people high school people and little people yeah like they say each one teach one so i'm really a, a teacher and a really good teacher <laughs> yeah i feel that and, it, and it's great to just see i think in life you always have to constantly like reinvent yourself and yes. any type of way and try and move on to that next step but for, when that reinvention comes there has to at one point there has to be an invention so we always like to go back into like the beginning of just how that invention sort of happened in a way. And you said 21 years old, you were thinking 42.5. That's definitely for back back then in like the, the 90s. That's even like what Wave Van Eker 43.0, you know, like nobody was the run 43.0 would have been amazing. But be thinking 42.5. So just to wonder. <laughs> what was your upbringing like what was your upbringing like with your parents and everything and just like your home how like to have that well, type of mindset of trying we, to reach for a goal like that we have to be very keen with this because i looked up at steve lewis steve lewis ran for the la jets mm -hmm. he ran 4387 at 19 at the time the record was 4318 I believe if you have all five uh, uh, components, you could do anything that another man could do. So Butch Reynolds had the, the world record, 43-18. And then Mike broke that in 96. I told Mike on TV, Michael Johnson, I said, yeah. I'm going to run 43 flat. That was already in my head. My coach, Coach James Robertson, he programmed that in my head when I was 10. He said, you can run 43 flat easily. And I'm like, okay. So from Bantam, Midget, Youth, Intermediate, you've seen all these drops because it was already programmed in my head. So that's why I say the first component is having a mentor, a coach, to say, okay, here's your potential. This is what you need to do to get to your potential. And this, this is going to be easy. When you start believing things are easy, then it just happens second nature. If you put in the work, if you have the genetics, if you take care of your business. So um, just doing the math with the numbers, 43 flat, 42, five would have been easy if I was healthy. If I lifted weights, which I never lifted weights, if I had a nutritional plan, it's just certain things that I know now that if I had back then, uh, people wouldn't even run the 400. <laughs> They don't even want. They don't want none of that smoke. But also, too, wait, can wait. you go now ahead. with the family? With the family, oh. I was lucky to have a mother that has a PhD, very smart, super intelligent, Memphis, Tennessee, good genetics. Father, um, a Minden, Louisiana, which is right out of Shreveport. He was six six, good genetics. Um, uh, they separated when I was in the seventh grade, so I grew up with a father. But for me. You know, dealing with the community, I know that my coaches, Coach James and Coach Moore was my mm -hmm. father. My coach, my coaches at um, John Muir High School, they was aspects of fatherhood. So I didn't miss out. So those five years, I would say from, what, seventh grade is like 13. So 13 yeah. to 18, I had father figures, even though my father was in Louisiana because uh, they separated. So I, I, I had a really kind of privilege 
<laughs> childhood. I didn't want for anything. Um, it was peaceful. And, uh, you know, I played soccer for six years, ran track. We was able to travel. Um, that's another great thing I love about track. You get to travel. <laughs> you get to yeah. travel and see all the different states. And if you're really good, you get to go out the country. And that's just exciting to, um, you know, be able to travel, go to Texas, go to Florida, go to Georgia, go to uh, Australia, go to Chile. And that makes you want to work even harder. Can you can you for people listening, they might not, not know about the L.A. Jets, but could you describe because the L.A. Jets is a legendary club in track and field, like one of the one of the best in the nation easily. But could you describe like the culture of the L.A. Jets a little bit when you were there? And also, could you like uh, give the people, you know, you know, gas up some of those times? Like, what were you running at 10 years old in the 400? Like, because you were running some crazy stuff. I, I need people to understand how legendary that that was. Well, the two coaches for the L.A. Jets on the boys' side, one is Ron Moore and the other one is Coach James Robinson. Ron Moore is like the father figure. They both father figures, but he's more like the, the father figure, making sure everything is ordered financially and all that stuff. Coach James is the math scientist. He's a mathematician. He goes in his head. He could tell you what you're going to run at the Junior Olympics by the first two weeks of you practicing in November. <laughs> he knows math. He knows science. He knows how to get you there and put together a formula on how to get you to your goal. He's going to ask you, what is your goal for this year? And he's going to reverse engineer it. Oh, you want to run 45? This is what you need to do. This is what you need to run in the mile. This is what you need to run in the 800. This is what you need to run in the 200. This is what you need to run in the 100. And then you put that together, and then you're going to get to your goal in the um, 400. So he's, he's, a, he's a scientist. Love him to death. I talk to him maybe quarterly a year um, just to stay in touch. They're they're older now, but they was the backbone for the boys side of the L.A. Jets. Really good people. Um, what were some of the like what was the first national record you set in club? And yeah, well, let, how- let me tell you, let, let me tell you this. And a lot of people don't know because they just see the records. I got my butt kicked by Jason Johnson. Jason Johnson was a monster every every year. From Bantam, Midget, Youth. I think I came into my own at Youth. But every year, it was a monster in my way. The first year was Jason Johnson. He had the national record. He had big goggles. He looked like he was 20 years old. I was scared to death. (laughs) Scared to death. And then I asked Coach James, I said, man, how can I be his record? Because he moved up to Midget, and then I was at the top of Bantam. So I was chasing after his record. So it made me step my game up. So um, I went back into the laboratory, started doing push-ups. I think I was doing like 200 push-ups a day and doing sit-ups. I just went back into the laboratory. I said, I got I to gotta beat this dude record. And then the next year, I ran into Michael Granville, another monster. Like, it, 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 it's going to make you bring out your character in person. How can I beat this dude? Like, who is this dude? Like, why is he running that fast? So every year... In every division, even when high school came, it's always somebody that's a little older than you, a little better than you. Yeah. But I had to figure out how to destroy them. And I really went in there. I, I got a book called Sung, uh, Tung Chung Yu, The Art of War. I started uh, developing my mind, uh, developing um, what Mike Tyson say, skullduggery. You know, putting a look on somebody, intimidating. In fact, like it was war to me. It's very serious. Because I'm weaponizing my mind. So it wasn't just physical. It was also mental and things that I had to do, like looking at film, um, getting in the mirror, looking at my form. I did a lot of stuff to develop myself to be a champion, but I always took losses. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you bring up Michael Granville, too, because in the beginning of our podcast, what I think almost two years ago now, we had Granville on the podcast talking about like his story and everything. And he brought up a story when... He like first raced you, I believe, in Spokane, Washington for the AAU right. Junior Olympics. And he was saying like he got to the stadium and him and his dad were walking and they just heard like uh, shimmers of just like, oh, you, oh, you, oh, you, oh, you, just across the entire stadium. That's how people that's how like that was 
that was built up to them. And then I think you said you guys raced in the four by four and everything like that. But being able to race against like uh, such people, such like great people of your time in that time, because Michael Granville, if people don't know, still has, holds the high school national record of one forty six five for over like tw- over like twenty five years now. But like you were also at John Muir, you're able to be around so many. Uh, let me tell you something think, about Mike. Let me tell you something about yeah, yeah. Michael Granville. His father, he I think he was third third leg on that relay. And another good friend of ours that was on that relay, his name is Red. Um, whoever was anchor, I think I ran them down, if I recall. Or something happened because Granville didn't really know me, and his father walked by me, and he his father looked like Malcolm X. It was really scary guy. He had the beard, he had his pipe. I think I think he had a pipe with his face on it. Really scary guy. You got to remember, I'm like 11 or 12. He said, "You will never beat my son again." I'm like, "What?" Well, I, I, I ran to my mom. I said, "Man, this this scary dude said I ne- and I never beat him again." Yo. <laughs> Real talk. So it's it's it, real talk. Never beat him again. Um, but yeah, that's how competitive uh age group and it's it's dangerous <laughs> when you got parents parents involved with psychology. That's psychology. And I never beat Michael Granville again. But Michael Granville bought the best out of me dealing mm-hmm. with the eight. And I will say this, and I'm gonna be fair, and we talk, we talk quite often. He never stepped down to my race. He didn't want none of those problems. But I always stepped up to his race. He never stepped down in the 400 to get that work, if you feel me. <laughs> I feel you. I feel, the 400 it's just hurts. The truth. It's just the truth. So I always went to Arcadia, challenged him. I think I took him out at 49 one time, and, and my legs felt like uh, <laughs> like two, <laughs> two buildings. But he never stepped down to my race. So I, I, when I always talk to him, I always say, I still owe you, bro. I still owe you. And I'm 43 years old. He's 44. I'm like, I'm going to get you one of these days. <laughs> but being able to race like around so many great people like that, I'm pretty sure you raced against people that maybe went to like the NFL and did oh, so many time. great things from like club track. Like, how has that like influenced you as well? Because I feel like for me and Aaron, one of the great things that we took around from running club was all like seeing – how that like we were around greatness, you know what I mean? And like that just kind of inspires us to do the great things that we attempt to do. They dream bigger than we ever thought. Well, bro, I got a friend, Marcellus Wiley. He's on ESPN every day. He's big bro. You know, he made yeah. $26 million with the Chargers. I helped him um, get there. He came to train with me. Like it's a good feeling. I could go down the list on probably over 100 people that came to train with me because I was that intense, you know, still start with still. It's easy. Whenever you see somebody successful, if you want to be a millionaire, get around some millionaires. Yeah. If you want to be fast, get around some fast people. <laughs> if you want to be smart, if you want to be a loser, get around some losers. <laughs> so it's kind of simple. If you want to accomplish something, somebody already accomplished it. So you get around the people that already accomplished it. It's an easy philosophy because it's going to rub off on you. Success leaves clues. <laughs> it's simple. Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Success leaves clues. So get around successful people, whatever your goal is in life. If you like cars, get around people that like cars. They're going to show you how to get a car. Fix your credit, go get a car. You pay, what, 400 bucks a month on looking cute in your car. If you want to be around fast people or people that run. When I went to Ethiopia, I mean, I'm a retria. I trained with, you know, I trained in high altitude because I wanted to get stronger and rebuild my body. And I rebuilt my body. So I got around people that was doing what I wanted to do. Life is kind of that simple. You want to be rich, get around rich people. You want to be healthy, get around healthy people. What do they say? Birds of a feather flock together. That's right. You know, and eagles and eagles fly alone. Mm. Mm. That's you, a whole nother subject. That's a whole nother subject. What would you say was the biggest thing? You know, you already described basically like 
club was super competitive when you're on that club scene. People knew who you are. You were battling every year, setting records. What was the biggest thing that you took away from your experience into in club, like heading into high school? For me, it was character. Character and ego. I always tell people, when you're competing, you got to have a planet-sized ego. My mother told me I was sick. I want to say in the sixth or seventh grade, I was sick. And um, she told me, you don't compete unless you're going to compete to win. That's not an excuse. I don't care if you're sick. If you're sick, don't go out there. But if you're going to compete, you go compete to win, period. You don't compete and just say, oh, I'm sick or my body hurt or my toe hurt. You're not that type of person. Mm. So character is the key. And how do you develop character? Do your parents your coaches, and then self-realization, you know, looking in the mirror. I did a lot of mirror work, looking in the mirror, like having my look, having my, you know, having my form. That 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 really works when you look in the mirror and say, oh, I'm going to write 45 flat on the mirror. I'm going to write 150 on the mirror. I'm going to write two flat, whatever your goal is. And you look at that every day and you're going to attract it. Because you're going to want to put in the work because you like the feeling afterwards. When you cross that line and people, oh, I want you to sign my shirt. I want you to sign my book. It's a good feeling. So it still goes back into emotion. You're doing, you're doing this for emotions. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that. And that, that's you're able to evoke a lot of emotion from definitely... A lot of people in your high school days, as we people said, a lot of Mermans of Obi definitely going into high school and everything that you're doing. I want to talk about this, too, because definitely just knowing from us being in a club like L.A. Jets, they did a lot of 800 work. And then even when you went into like I see I feel like every single person on the Jets was running 800. A lot of people run the 3000 even in club, even if they ran 100. But then like once they got to high school, you were also still kept that same strength work of running like the 800 and I, us being like 800 guys, it's always interesting to see somebody that's more like 4'8 kind of attack it that way. What was your relationship kind of like with the 800 as you were like first going into high school and afterwards as well? Because you're running uh, 149 and still running like, that's that's fast, bro. Yeah, it's okay. I think it was, um, <laughs> I think it was probably like 65% because I didn't train as, like when I trained with Johnny Gray, I want to say Johnny Gray just lost his Olympic or his American record a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, these dudes are doing two a days. They have way more mileage. Um, I'm just gonna be fair, and it's not throwing no jabs. Uh the the national record for high school is weak. It should be more like 144 if you had a speed. If you look at the body type of Michael, Michael's a big guy. To run. So he's running with power. If you look at the 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 Kenyans, the Ethiopians, they're thinner, they're taller. Um, I want to say Mike is about five eleven. Um, I'm six one. So I think with my speed, if I really trained properly for the eight hundred, I could in high school I probably could have read one forty four mid. Cause I had more speed than Mike, but I didn't train myself for the, um, <clears throat> for the, uh, 800 properly, like a real 800 meter runner, even though I ran good. I think I had the national record at Bantam 219 or 218. I had the national record at midget. Then he had the national record at youth and intermediate. If I recall, um, but I kind of backed away from, the 800 because I didn't like it. It hurt. <laughs> but if I had more base and more mileage underneath me, my lactic acid threshold would have been higher. Yeah. I could have ran, I could because I was faster than Mike. I could have ran faster than him. But, you know, it's just stuff that you learn over the years. As far as the 100, if, if I knew what I knew now, I could have ran 10-1 in high school in the 100. So it's just a balance on having that um having that coach 
you know, kind of map out when you're supposed to peak for what race. So, you know. I wouldn't say that I, I couldn't say that the the national record's weak, but I I do think that it may be like weaker than you see. Like I, I definitely could see people running 144 because the Kenyans, they be doing it. People that 17, 18 years old, the let me say, let me cut you, let me cut of you people off that, that could be running the eight. Let me cut you off on that. We have to start saying stuff is weak, so we change the paradigm. When we start saying 43 flat is weak, somebody's gonna run 42.5. You have to put it in your mind first. When we seen Usain Bolt do what he did, we thought 10 years prior, 9-9 uh, uh, nine, nine was fast. Somebody in their mind, yeah, mind said 9-7 is fast. I'm about to run 9-7. We have to change it. That's how we advance as humans. You got to break the paradigm mm -hmm. that really you think that that's fast. It's not fast. Cause we said it's not fast. When that dude broke the um broke the mile record, right? I want to say in the sixties or seventies. I think maybe five hundred people that ran faster than four flat now, right? Yeah. Because they yeah. believe that he could do it. When somebody say, "Man, we could do it," then that little kid that's ten, oh, Obi Moore, he said he could run. I'm a I'm a live up to what he said he could do. I'm a run forty two five. You gotta break the you gotta break the mind the mindset. It's not fast. Michael Michael Granville record is not fast. It's good, but it's not fast. One thing about uh, Michael Granville when we had him on, and I'm curious to see what you think about this. Like, I felt like Michael Granville when he was in high school with his dad coaching him, he was low key training like as if he was a was a pro, like picking and choosing his races and stuff like that. Where as for you, you were you were like putting all these different meets, doing the dual meets and stuff like that. What do you think that would have been like for you if you would have been able to maybe just have someone that's picking take, your race you for you to do and stuff? I think the incarnation of me is Michael Norman. Mm. Michael Norman did everything I was supposed to do. He picked his races. He peaked at the right time. And I think he had um, a good team around him because you got to realize I'm dealing with two different coaches. So yeah. I'm dealing with Clyde Turner and I'm dealing with Coach James. So it was just overtraining. It was just too much on the body. That's why the body, the body's going to respond and say, "Hey, we don't want you going there because you're going to hurt yourself. So we're going to we're going to slow you down. We're going to give you a little owie." In my in my mind, I'm like, "Oh, this is just a little owie. I'm gonna keep running on it, knowing yeah. I shouldn't have been running on it." And you keep tearing that muscle, keep tearing that muscle down. But that's the ego. That's what happened with me. The ego. Hey, I want to be seen. I want to run fast. I want the high knee. I want to look good. I want to get the girls. You know, the ego will will mess you up. You got to know the balance. But yeah, it was way too much running. If if they would have peaked me at the right time, I'm telling you, a lot of these records that been standing, they're weak. Coach James well, told me I should have ran 44 flat as a junior. And then I would have doubled back if I ran under 146 and 800. I would have ran 43 flat as a senior. I mean, I can't. I agree with you because you ran you ran 45 as a sophomore, and you ran exactly. one, anyone that can run 45, but then you're running 149, not training like an 800 meter runner. It's like exactly. you you that's may what, have ran 147, 146 that year. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But the relays. And everybody want to be a sprinter. It's more exciting to be on the relay, the four by two, the four by one. You're doing the indoor. But if I would have focused on those real goals, yeah, those records. Um, like I said, a lot of people wouldn't even run track. They'd be like, "I'm I'm cool. I, I don't even want to approach that." How, how about I want to ask you? Wait, one more thing. As go your ahead, sophomore year at state, when you when you hawked down homeboy in the four by four, why'd you why'd you do that? Where's that him, man bro? at now? Why why did he quit after that? Did he stop running? Like you could have caught him way earlier. Why'd you have to do it to him? No, like I didn't. That? I did. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> you could have so, though. You could have caught him in the first two, but you were like, "Let me wait." <laughs> no, no, no. See, I, I'm a scientist, right? I'm a scientist when I come to the track. I knew because we had raced at Arcadia, 
mm. and they had switched the real they had switched the legs up on us right okay. and morningside was our rival morningside um um uh McClimate and uh dorothy so i knew he got out out of fear because if you look at the race he got out like he was running 200 i got out <laughs> calm because i know my race i know my body I know I need to come through at the 200 at a certain time. I know when I need to make my move. He was scared because he knew I was coming for him. And um, I feel sad because that's my boy. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's my boy. <laughs> but really that energy came from losing the 200. I'll, I, I want to say I cried after the 200. Michael Harrison ended up going to UCLA with Mike, Michael Granville. And he was from Georgia, and he just snuck in there. He, I think he was in lane eight or lane seven, and I was really disappointed because I wanted the 200 go, and I wanted the 400 go, which I got the 400 go, and I want the four by four. I don't recall. We might have took second or third in the four by one, but I wanted those goals. I like gold. You know how they say it's in the black people's soul to rock that go. I like that go. <laughs> and um, so I'm like, man. I told Coach Ely, I said, I hope something special happens. So Sutan McCullough uh, went to USC, ended up playing for the Raiders or somebody. He had a little alley. He had hamstring problems. So he was limping. So if you look at him and you look at me, I try to grab the baton from Suti. And um, I'm like, give me that baton because these dudes, this dude is out there. And I missed the first grab. So I'm like, damn, he really getting out. And um, I was just patient. I was just patient. And then when I seen him look back, if you see about the last 130, 140, he looks back. I said, I got this sucker. <laughs> I said, I got this sucker. <laughs> and I made my move. I made my move. And uh, the monkeys, the monkeys and the gorillas, they, they jumped right on him. And I said, I Wait, got How him. loud was Cerritos? How loud oh, was, was Cerritos? But when you're in that zone, hundred. bro, you don't hear nothing. Yeah, when yeah, you yeah. tap into your zone, you don't hear nothing. It was just me and him. And then he fell at the end. And I kept, and I said, oh, I feel bad for him. He's, Wait, he's, did he, he hear can't it, even though? go back to school. And the funny thing about it, one of my, one of my clients, his name is Big E. He, he lost, he lost his, um, his mortgage money. Them guys was betting two, $3,000 in the stands. He called wow, me almost wow. every day and he buys CMOS and detoxes from me. He said, man, you still owe me some money. I said, man, it ain't my fault. <laughs> Y'all should train that boy better. <laughs> it ain't my fault. But honestly, if the crowd wasn't as loud and he didn't panic, they should have won that race. Yeah. Because I so imagine... other elements involved. He should have won that race. He got out too fast. Yeah. He should have just relaxed. He had he had a 60 meter lead. But he panicked and the crowd when they got this, oh, we, oh. yeah, the crowd actually won the race for me. So he looked back a couple of times. It was over. Now comparing that crowd to pin relays, winning that. Oh, that crowd was that crowd was way better than the pin relay. Now pin relays is a whole wow. different energy, but that was I would say that was my most historical race, and the best feeling I ever had competing. And I didn't ran thousands of races. That was a. That was a and people came out the stands. They jumped. I'm throwing people off me. I'm saying, man, you didn't believe in me. Get, get, get off me. <laughs> I, I, man, I felt that was the great. Now holding that American flag, beating the Jamaicans, being nominated. I mean, I mean, being uh celebrated where we all four jog around. That was a good feeling. But compared to that state meet, yeah, that state mm -hmm. meet was the best feeling I ever felt in track and field. Man. Running all these 45s at like 15, 16, when you're running those times, are you thinking like, yo, I'm, I'm going to go pro? Did that ever cross your mind to just yeah, of course. go pro? Of course. Yeah, I knew I was going to go pro when I was 10 years old. But did now you, the thing, you? Now, the thing about it, what, a, what most people don't know, I thought it was slow. Because mm. Coach James always told me, whatever you can run on the relay, you can run in the open. He said, yeah. you just got to pick your spirit up. I'm like, what does he mean? But when you're dealing with other people on the team, you're actually tapping into their energy because you're running for somebody else. 
So I couldn't figure out how to pick my spirit up. Because if I could run 44-1, which I did the year prior, I should be able to run 44-1 as a junior. But I couldn't figure it out. So I thought it was slow. Like those 45s, I think I ran like 26 45s that year. That's crazy. Yeah. And yeah, it is. And uh yeah, I'm like, man, this is slow. I, I need to be running faster, but I think I was running too much. Yeah. Let the body, that's why I love Michael Norman. I think he ran maybe like 12 races the whole year. <laughs> I think what how like uh coach James Roberts Roberts James coach James was coaching you it's very similar to this guy right now at Newberry Park. I don't know if you've heard of Sean Bronson and what Newberry Park has done over the past year, but they just broke the four by mile indoor record. They got a guy that already broke four minutes, ran 358, and their splits for the four by mile were four oh was what it was four eleven, four oh seven, four oh seven, then a three fifty-eight. And these guys, they they have the three fastest uh, three mile times ever for high school, high school and cross country. So they're running insane. But the th big thing about but, Sean Bronson is he's saying that like four twenty is slow for a, for right. a high school boy, and he's saying like he was talking to them for the uh, the four by mile record in the national record, saying that they can get the American record. They were trying to get the the high school record, but the American record is four oh is sixteen oh three. And just imagine, like you saying, like Colin Solomon can split like a three fifty eight still, and they can all run in their four. But like, you're how do you feel about? I know you already kind of like talked about it, but having those direct par parallels to now seeing another like Newberry Park is one of the greatest high school cross country teams we ever seen, and they may have two or three guys under four minutes in the outdoor season this year. Do you really feel like that's the great way? That's the best way to get to an athlete to that level, definitely in high school, to dream big, to even something like the American record in a sense. Yeah, that's incredible, man. I never even heard of them. Where are they located? Newberry Park in uh, it's like a thousand, thousand Oaks. Uh, oh, they're thousand in California. Oaks yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah, California. Yeah. Okay, I got to look them up. I, I don't really follow track like that anymore. But yeah, I have to look them up. I think you got to get it while it's hot. I think you got to get it while it's hot. Of course, you want to think about the future. But if you rolling, like I said, Steve Lewis won the Olympics at 19. UCLA, 43-87. You're not guaranteed the next step. Anything could happen. So if you rolling, keep rolling. You always want to develop. But if they rolling... Man, they need to go get that record because you're not guaranteed. I seen um, the 92, I think it was either the 88 Olympics or the 92 Olympic trials. Mike Marsh could have broke the world record and he slowed up the last like 25 meters in the 200. He was rolling. You get it while it's hot. Mm -hmm. You get it while it's hot. You don't want it cold because mm -hmm. track, you could go bad. You could spend eight years like I did trying to recover when you hot you hot that's when you get it so if they hot they need to go get it that's how yeah. i look at it they about to do a four by mile outdoor against at pin you know, relays actually they need to do it against professionals to that's bring to we, we, we had the opportunity to run the four by four at mount sack in 97 i got hurt i wanted to run but coach wouldn't let me run I'm like, man, we could have broke the national record running against college college cats because they're going to take us to the next level. But it, yeah. I don't know if it would have been a legal national record. But, yeah, hey, they need to get it. But I don't know if it will be legal if they running against college guys. It's, hey, fast is fast. It don't even matter at that point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's going to be the true. record people are going to remember. People going around yeah. what they did. Yeah. When so you so when did the injuries start start for you? Um and what kind of what kind of catapulted that? What do you think led to the injuries and what kind of started that? Well, me and Sutan, we had ditch school to go see some girls. Get to the track meet late. It was a dual meet. Um 
I had I had had owies before, but no real injuries. Like maybe knees hurt, you know, some soreness, um, but never no injuries my whole career from seven to seventeen. And uh, I didn't stretch. We running on dirt. We the, we the biggest school on the planet, but we running on dirt. I got out there and ran forty seven. I think mid in the four hundred. And um, I felt something. I told coach, I'm like, man, I feel something. So I iced and whatever. But I didn't really treat it because I never I never had an injury yeah. before. And then the next time I felt it, it was a little deeper into the muscle. And um, I started going to deep tissue in Cerritos, California, and they breaking down the muscle. But I don't really know the science of the muscle. So I'm thinking I'm feeling good, but the muscle was really broken down and I'm still running fast. So I'm thinking I'm okay, but the muscle was really weak because the fibers of the muscle is broken down. And um, it just kept every week, every two weeks, it just kept like pulling. And I just kept running on it. When I ran um, at Arcadia, I was hurt. I think, uh, yeah, I stopped in the, no, I jogged in in the 800, I think at 151, like the last 150. My my muscle was totally pulled. Then I think two weeks after that we had Mount no not Mount Sac. I had to run at Mount Sac, and then it was pin relays. My muscle was pulled, and mm -hmm. I I just wanted to run because of my ego. And it was my senior year, and um I think I ran forty four on that leg with a pulled hamstring. Um, but yeah, man, it was just it was just one of the biggest mistakes that I made in my life, and I regret it because. If I think four years from now and really think in the future, I would have been 22. Um, the world would have seen, um, you know, a 40, a 42, five, and it would have been different. You know, I probably would be sitting on a hundred million dollars. So I got a good personality and, um, yeah, I, I, Hey, forgive me, track and field world. I messed up. But Hey man, I, I have, I have two questions from that. Just first, like, why don't you just run like 50 or like 51 in the dual meet? And then second, like what advice would you give to another like elite high school athlete at that time? At, at, in a time like in their high school when they have like an injury and stuff like that and trying to recuperate now, looking back what, what happened to you. But in the dual meet though, like why not just run like 50 and like get like the win or something like that? In the dual well, I've run, I run 50 in the first lap of the 800. That's not my personality. When you're when you're in a certain zone, you kind of you 47 is slow. I run 45. I'm on dirt. So I gotta kind of stay in the zone. And then when I felt it, if I was smart, I would have waited for like six weeks or two months and like really go to therapy. You dealing with somebody that's the fastest person on the planet at their age, and I just didn't have the right people around me. Even though Coach James said, hey, but you got two different personalities. You got Coach Turner, Coach James. This is mm -hmm. my senior year. Coach, Coach Turner, hey, we got to get this relay. You okay? I'm feeling okay, but I'm not knowing my body because I never had injuries before. So if I'm thinking about the future, four years, eight years from now, I'm going to back away. I'm going to go get an ice bath. I'm going to go get, you know, uh, x-rays. I'm going to take this as a job rather than me being a high school yeah. competitor because it wasn't worth it. And then I did a disservice to the track and field community, but I didn't know any better. I just wanted to compete and run fast and enjoy yeah. my ego. <laughs> At the end of the day, you were, you were a kid, you know, you were a high yeah. school kid enjoying high school, you know, trying to hang out with girls and stuff. And how did you, yeah. How did you balance like, First of all, one thing too, when I think about you, I'm like, man, if social media was around when you were in high school, man, shoot, I know you were already huge. Bro, you got to think, man. You got to think. I had a Volvo. My, um, one of my father figures, he was a multimillionaire. Um, I had an Afro. I kind of looked like Snoop Dogg <laughs> at the time. <laughs> I had a good personality. I was fun. If social media was around, that's why I say, bro, if I was 10 years later, like 2007, 
Oh my goodness. Like it, like look at you saying. He's yeah. a global icon. I would have been a global icon. And I put in the work. I didn't do nothing faulty. I didn't deal with no steroids. I never got busted for anything. I Marion Jones, global icon. You know what I mean? It would have been like that. 2000, just think if I came out rather than rather than running 96 if I came out in 2000, which would be four, what, four years later? Mm-hmm. I would be a global icon. And I was on the way. It was just little mistakes that I made and that the team around me made that um, it's, it's kind of like a disservice to um, uh, human potential because I'm willing to go there mentally. But like I said, I didn't lift weights, which is very, if you look at the, you look at my Facebook, I put a picture of me and Michael Johnson. Um, I was on the cover of some magazine and he was on swole. He's strong. You need that strength. When you running that fast, you need that, that strength. And he probably looked like he was 30 pounds bigger than me. And I'm right next to him. I'm like, man, I wish I would have lifted weights, you know, and had a little more strength on my body. So it's just little keys that, you know, I didn't know any better. You know, I just didn't. I know you said that your team around you was like Coach Turner and Coach Coach Robertson around you. But like, were there, was anyone else like really around you like at that time in like high school that you would go like for counsel Anything oh, like yeah, that, or time. just your two, two, two runners? And what were they like telling you at the time? No, like, big trying time. to keep I you had, on that track. I had, I had um, Anthony Larsu. I had uh, Chris, uh, Chris Ward. My team, my team, and then I had my LA Jet team members that were running for Dorsey, running for Long uh-huh. Beach Poly. So, but we all grew up together, so we all family. So. Um, you know, I was getting advice from all type of people. And then I'm getting recruited. So John Smith is calling me. Uh, Bubba Thornton from University of Texas. You know, so I'm getting it from because I literally I was the next one. I'm getting recruited by everybody. So I'm getting advice on how to eat all type of stuff, man. So I, I was getting advice. But mentorship, I would say. Um, I would say Coach James and um, Anthony Larsu was my biggest mentors because I was with Anthony almost every day. Mm -hmm. Um, He gave me a 61 candy apple red uh, Impala to go to prom in the 10th grade. Like he's like my big brother. So. And I I would say too, like, how do you, because you said talking to a lot of people, like you said, your next big thing, like a lot of people going to give you advice. Like how do you sort through all of that stuff? I know you got the two people next to you as well but like kind of take like nuggets from other people but like how so was that I, overwhelming to just have people always trying to be all like you should do this you should do that and like as well so what so what i would do is get the get the nuggets from the other people and then tell coach james about it and he'll give yeah. me his wisdom tell lars Sewell about it then he'll give me his wisdom then i make my decision yeah, go to someone that you you know you can fully trust has the best in mind for you too, and then take that take that into consideration over everything else. But yeah, I know that definitely must have been hard, like being a star and having so many people telling you so many different different things and everything, getting recruited, and um, we know that it didn't it didn't work out. You had to go to a a JUCO a JUCO first. What was like your first initial reaction to well, when did you realize it? What was it like that moment you realized like, dang, I'm not going to go straight to a university. I'm going to have to go to. Chico oh, it first. was horrible. It was embarrassing. It was tragic. It was to go to PCC, knowing that you want to be an SC, you know, with your boys. I had Jerome, uh, Vince, Felix Sanchez, um, just monsters. And uh, it was embarrassing. But that's what I'm saying. Having the planet size ego, you always want the best. And that might have been the best thing for me um, at that time to go to a JUCO and then rebuild myself. Kind of like a boxer. You don't go fight Tyson and you just got knocked out. You go fight yeah. somebody lesser and then build yourself up. But I'm so used to being at the heights year after year after year after year after year for 10 years. 
you're talking about from seven to 17, I'm at the top of the sport. And maybe two years at a JUCO would have been better so I could build myself back up. Okay, I went through an injury. Just take two years. Just get your base back down. You know, get your 800 and your mile and your mileage back down. And then the next two years go to a USC, a UCLA, a University of Texas, a University of Florida. But I wasn't thinking like that. I wanted it too fast because I'm so used to having it year in, year out, being at the top. Year in, year out, being at the top. And sometimes you can't always be at the top. Yeah. I understand sort of where you're coming from because when I went to first went to college, I went to Cal State Northridge to go run there. And then Are we you had, with Coach Jeff? No, I was with I was with uh uh Boogie with Boogie, oh, Boogie. Lawrence Johnson. Yeah, Lawrence Johnson yeah, yeah. was there. Uh, coach in there and but then I, I was running distance though so cross country and so our cross country coach left then after that season it just wasn't the right fit so I went back to I went to Mount Sac for the next two years to go run there like you know do you know like with Kamaka Kamaka recently just passed away rest in peace to Kamaka and oh, wow. uh Le, and Lenaro so I was with them but like I remember my first time just going back to community college I was like man I just want to be out of here Cause like yeah. I, I got good, I got pretty good grades and everything, and I felt like I should be at university. Like I should be running way faster than I am. But it was definitely like a learning experience and like a new find, like love for like the sport. Definitely like going to Mount Sac and experiencing that. So, but definitely, I totally agree. At the first start of that, like when you think you should be somewhere else and you yeah. have to go to a JC, it's 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 embarrassing. But like, it is. How do it you? Is. Now, you, now I'm like, if you were this. to go back, though, you would do it. You would try and like do the JC no. route and stuff. Now, no, no, I wouldn't. Mike, uh, Mike Marsh, not Mike Marsh. Um, Dennis Mitchell called me. He said, "Obi, everything's gonna be okay. This is after my injury. I want to say it's summertime, so it's after state meet. I think state meet is June 6th. And he said, "I could get you a contract with Nike. Don't worry. He he didn't say f. He said, man, forget college. I want to use another word. But he said, don't worry about it. I'll get you a contract with Nike. And uh -huh. I'm like, my mama, is a, she wants me to go to college. So I got mm. my mom in my head. Like, I got to go to college because my mom, you know, was a principal at a high school. She was a principal at DeWarty High School at the time. Um, and I'm like, man, my mama kicked my butt if I went pro. I should have went pro. I feel the same about Michael Granville. I'm like, I feel like yeah, they would have hooked me up with a John Smith, who's a who's a master at the 400. He mm -hmm. still owns the yeah. four, you know, and he would have said, OK, let me break him down, remake him. Because when I talked to John Smith, maybe five, six years later, he told me to run 10 miles. I said, 10 miles. He said, <laughs> I, I, I thought he was joking. He was like, you that type of athlete. You like, um. Uh, what was his name from Morocco? Hisham El Garouj. Yeah, yeah. Man, I tried to run uh, two laps. I quit. <laughs> I'm like, I can't <laughs> run no. Ten but he he's like a philosopher. So John Smith, I don't know if he meant. And I think about this all. I don't know if he meant break it down and then come back. He said, "I want you to run ten miles." I said, 10 miles. I never ran over two miles." But he's like, but I think that would have been a good fit. With a mm -hmm. John Smith and the times that we have talked, we have similar personalities dealing with the science of speed. So it's you know coming coming from the embarrassment and then not being able to perform at the highest levels. I think a good four years, two to four years after my injury with the right coach, I yeah. would have been fine. I would have been fine. When you were going through all these different through, through the JUCOs and stuff, trying to figure out on the college route, did you ever think about just moving up to that eight hundred? You think that would have helped with the injury? You would have just just did that oh, did that eight oh, big time, big time. That's why I say my whole career was based off the eight, which made my sprinting better. When I got to high school, the relays, the sprinting is enticing. But if you look at Bantam, I had the national record in the eight. When I moved up to the top of Bantam, I broke the national record in the 400. So every year, at, every year, Coach James always had me run the eight at the bottom. 
uh, from Bantam, Midget, Youth. Then when I got to high school, which is intermediate, I stopped running the eight with the intensity. Even though I was still fast, yeah. I was still good in the eight. The intensity, if I did it like I did it for the first six years, that's why I say that that 144 would have been easy uh, with my body frame and my speed in high school. It would have been easy. Yeah. I, I, I believe I believe that too, because definitely, like are you saying when Granville like was a bigger dude, you seemed like you were definitely more thin, more thinned out. Man, John Smith, he was trying to make you a 15 guy. You could have made 10 miles. <laughs> no, he said 10 miles. He wanted he wanted me to start training. Been like, at 1500. Like a professional um um uh, uh quarter miler. And I'm like, 10 miles, I can't run 10 miles straight. But he was gonna break me all the way down and then build me up. Hey, I would I would have liked to see that. I would have would have liked yeah, to me see too. that. I definitely been. Yeah, me too. <laughs> like how you're saying too, I think definitely if you're you're uh if you're born like Michael Norman's time, if you're up 2015 and everything and having the resources around you of people that we've seen, like, because we're doing this next stop Oregon thing with world championships coming up pretty soon. Oh, trying I'll to sell here. tickets for people to go to Oregon and like seeing people now, like Arion Knighton, I don't know, the 16, what is Arion Knighton running the 200, but breaking number two, like all time, just the bolt when he was like 16 and now yeah. going pro with like Adidas. I feel like having because social media has opened up so many doors for people to get that information or people just dropping in the DMs and stuff like that and provided like people already like shown the way of how to go like pro out of high school. It would have been, I think, 10 years, 10 years later, if you were born, it would definitely the game would have been totally different for you. For sure. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think the first person that did it was Allison Felix. Yeah, yeah, and it was a gradual, beautiful process for her. Like I was on her level. Mm -hmm. Like it would have just, hey, slow down for a year or two. Let's build a real strong base. Put you back out there, market you. You got a nice afro, <laughs> and you're fast. <laughs> I think it would have been perfect, but it was just mistakes made in the camp, and then mistakes made in my psyche because I expected cer certain things at a certain age and I'm a Capricorn, so I'm stubborn. So <laughs> when I don't get my way, I just like, man, I'm cool. Ended up in Georgia, just going through it, man. I think I went to seven colleges, but my heart was always at SC. So yeah. when your heart somewhere, you're going to create, you're going to create, uh disruptions disruptions if that's a word you're going to create situations where you want to get up out of there and that's what i was doing i was uh self-sabotaging myself fighting acting the fool you know just regular stuff that people do when they're not in the position that they want to be in do you would you say do you feel like i know for sure you've grown from it do you feel like you've healed from all of all everything that kind of happened within that seven year span because I know being like the twenties is just like a a, a a wild time for a person trying to find themselves and everything. Do you feel like you healed from everything that's happened then? And when did you start to like really like find find yourself to I, feel like I would say my healing, my ultimate healing for track and my disappointment in myself. Is going to come through the movie. Because I think about track every day. I'm like, when it's in you, it's in you. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I go on Instagram. I love track, but I hate it at the same time. I hate the black eye that's in it. I hate the people that I competed against. They got busted for steroids and I didn't know they was on steroids. I'm like, damn, I'm, I'm drinking Gatorade and eating chicken. <laughs> I'm like, this dude was on steroids. What? I mean, then I think like, man, what if I got on steroids? I might have ran 41. But um, I, I still love the sport. I love to see people compete. Um, but I think my ultimate healing is going to come through um, my movie and then inspiring that next generation, that next little girl, little boy say, you know how they did in the Malcolm X movie? I'm Malcolm X. I want somebody to say, yeah, I'm Obi Moore. <laughs> yeah, I'm Obi Moore. I want somebody to say, I'm Obi Moore. He inspired me. He didn't, let me pass it to, so I want my movie to be, 
I'm passing the torch in very detail on what went wrong and how to fix it. Because it shouldn't mm-hmm. happen like that. Yeah. It shouldn't happen like that. I'm I'm hyped for that. I really am. I'm really excited for that. To, yeah, I'm I'm excited for that too. And speaking of just like the people of today running as well, we speak a little bit more. We speak a little bit earlier just on Michael Norman. It's definitely going to be exciting trying to see all of them. I, I definitely at World Championships in Eugene. You already said you're going to be there. Just how excited are you for that to happen for the track world and track community? Because we definitely about trying to bring track to the masses. You know, we want hey, track to be mainstream, know, my- and that and we've all been trying to do that forever. But how excited are you for Eugene? Like World Championships Man, in the I'm US. I'm super excited. Like I tell everybody for the last six years, track is back. I'm waiting for somebody to disappear on the track. I want somebody to run so fast. I want people to tap into those zones where it's like, I, I want to see um, Elaine break that world record. That's where mm-hmm. I'm really going. When she did that back step uh, after she ran that fast last year, she's, I, ooh, I got excited about track again. I said, wow, she's stepping back. It, it was just smooth. So, um, yeah, I... Yeah, I can't wait to see her break the world. I think she's going to break the world. That's why I'm really going. I want to see her break the world record. And um, I haven't been to a major championship since the 96. Um, no, I went to Olympic trials in 2000. I went to Olympic trials in 2000. And um, yeah, so I can't wait. That's 20, 22 years ago. Yeah. Like I say, track is back. We need to we need to tap into tap into our gifts and 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 inspire other people, man, to do greater than us. We're reaching that golden age of track. I really do believe that right now. It can I think we'll look back as a, a shift, definitely. But as we start yeah, closing like out the podcast, yeah, it's like a renaissance. Yeah, age. most definitely, most definitely a renaissance. But as we start closing out, I also want to talk on this. We have just a few more questions before we get out of here, like. You were rock. You were rocking the cornrows for a good minute, a long, long time. Like I just got my cornrows, but like a year or two ago, just like what? How has your hair journey been? Like in in a sense, and just why was it always the cornrows? That was the look, you know. That was the hey, look. I gotta keep it gangster, Snoop Dogg. <laughs> so I started off with the fro, and then my hair is a little curly. So when the fro got too big. I'm like, man, my hair's all in my eyes. I'm going to church and I got this big old afro. <laughs> so I started braiding it because Snoop Dogg had the braids. He started off with the fro. And uh I just emulated Snoop Dogg. And that's that's, that's about it. Now I got locks. My locks are down to the middle of my back, but Snoop Dogg got locks. But no, that was one of my um that was one of the people that I looked up to was Snoop Snoop Dogg. And uh, you know, at the time in our generation. You had Bone Thugs and Harmony. A lot of people just had braids and hair. Uh, ice, yeah. Ice T, even um, um, Ice Cube at the time. So that was just the look. So you know, the mid '90s, early '90s, like you got to have some hair to be playing. You know what I mean? So we definitely appreciate you coming on. We got two more questions that we always ask our guests that come on the podcast. For one, like sometimes we don't know who to get like next on the podcast sometimes, or just <laughs> guests that we should get. So who do you think? Would be a great person to come on the Two Black Runners podcast. Who do you think would be a great interview that fits the mold, fit the hype, and talk deep with us? Who would be a great person to come on the Two Black Runners podcast next? Be someone that's an athlete, coach, somebody outside of running, someone that would be a great conversation. I would say John Smith, HSI. That would be that would be hard. I think y'all num- I think y'all numbers will go up to a million. He has so much wisdom. Um, you guys know um, the movie Higher Learning? Omar yes. Epps? Yeah, he was in Higher Learning. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, John Smith? Yeah, he had the beard. He was the coach, the track coach. What? Hold wait, wait. <laughs> wait, hold on, Rad. You guys don't know I'm a historian, too. I do a lot of research. If I you did pull not up know John that Smith, that. That's so remember, funny. I, Remember Ice Cube and, and and the guy at the tower in Texas? They they did the shooting. John Smith was the coach. Wow. 
And last question, we always like to ask this question, kind of deep, but I think it's a great way to always end the podcast. What mark do you want to leave on the sport? What do you want people to remember about Obi? Um, I want to be the inspiration that sparks the person to live out what I thought I could accomplish. If it's through the book, if it's through the movie, if, if it's through my shoe, you know, when you used to get the Jordans, you put the Jordans on, you, you felt a little different. Like, man, I just got the Jordans. When somebody put my shoe on, I want them to, man, I feel like I could fly. When somebody see my movie and get inspired, man, I think I could go out there and really train for 10 years, 15 years and break the world record. When somebody read my book or a child read my book, it sparks them to say, I want to do what this man didn't do because other stuff came along in his life injuries you know self-doubt um um lack of confidence i want to be able to do what he didn't do so inspiration i love that i love to hear i love to hear it so excited for uh what you have coming next from the book the movie the shoe anything that what it looks like if you ever bring something out bring it our way let us know and we'll we'll definitely promote it and let people know that it's happening because i think it's a story worth telling and people are definitely going to keep on telling it aaron like to keep on telling it like this was a good one aaron for real yeah man hey, uh, you guys send everybody to obmore.com when i when i when i fund this bitcoin to get my nft the shoe is going to be invel- available for the nft so we're going to take the nft um, with pre-orders and then you're going to see the prettiest shoe that you ever seen in life. I got five shoes but the elite shoe you're going to want to put on a mantle is beautiful and then if you if you get the NFT the book comes with it and when we put out the movie you get free access to well you're actually paying for it but you get uh, um, <laughs> um, access to the movie because you're pre-ordering you know the whole the whole uh obi Moore brand i love it i love to hear it i love i love to see you're trying to still be innovative bring new things like we don't really have any black running shoe brands out here like that either so definitely want to help any way possible want to give you your flowers too for what you have accomplished is crazy and amazing i feel like people get caught up on like what you could have done but they neglect what you have done and yeah. it's impacted so many people that you don't even you don't even know about and you've already inspired so many people so bro truly appreciate you man no, thank coming you, on thank the you. podcast bro thank you thank you yeah, i appreciate y'all remember 43 ain't fast 420 ain't fast, <laughs> ain't fast you feel me? hey rethink <laughs> rechange the paradigm bro thanks for everybody That's listening right. this week